Well, uh, it's been a while since I promised two more parts to my snake video. This one will be a list format just like the first, though the last video, or videos, Snakes in the Divine might actually be two because as per usual, when I start digging into a topic, a ton comes up. I will say the last two are going to be structured like my usual content, as there is so much to dive into there. With that out of the way, let's dive into the Anguiforms, or snake hybrids, of Greek mythology. Kaidete. It's been forever since I had a fan art submission to show off, so it is with a great deal of pride and excitement that I give you Lecturing Me from longtime server member Mathematical Cabbage. It's adorable! If you submit fan art in my Discord server that is safe for work, as it were, I will show it off at the start just like I did for this one. Thank you again for your awesome art. This video was actually really fun to research. I knew quite a few of these were Anguiforms, but the depth of the symbolism and the breadth of mythic variations for a few caught me by surprise. And one of them, number two, caught me totally off guard, as well as many of the folks I know. With that out of the way, let's get to the list. Number 13, Typhos. Any list talking about Anguiforms has got to talk about the father of monsters himself. He and his consort Echidna, who we'll talk about next, sired quite a few of the other composites that we'll be looking at in this video. In his monograph, Dracon, Daniel Ogden notes that Typhon has both the most extensive textual attestation and some of the least extensive iconographic representation. Basically, this means he was written about a lot, but not drawn very often. Part of this might have been the sheer artistic challenge in depicting him as described. The earliest mention of Typhon we have is in Theogony, where Hesiod describes him as, Now, after Zeus had driven the titans out of heaven, gigantic Gaia, in love with Tartaros, by means of golden Aphrodite, bore the youngest of her children, Typhus. The hands and arms of him are mighty, and have work in them, and the feet of the powerful god were tireless, and up from the shoulders there grew a hundred snake heads, those of a dreaded Dracon. And the heads licked with dark tongues, and from the eyes the inhuman heads fire glittered glittered from under the eyelids. From all his heads, fire flared up from his eyes glancing, and inside each of these horrible heads there were voices that threw out every sort of horrible sound. For sometimes it was speech, such as the gods could understand, but at other times it was the sound of a bellowing bull, proud-eyed and furious beyond holding, or again like a lion, shameless in cruelty, or again like the barking of dogs, a wonder to listen to, or he would whistle so the tall mountains re-echoed to it. Yeah, I wouldn't want to try and draw that either. A hundred serpent heads? Imagine the frustration of having to start over painting that on a vase. Over and over and over. Anyway, speculation aside, he was one bad dude. Thought to be buried under Mount Etna in ancient times, Typhus decided that the divine order as established by Zeus wasn't his shtick, and everything would actually be better if he were in charge. So Typhus stormed Olympus, and Zeus met him in battle. Hesiod describes the clamor in less detail than later writers, though he does stress that the fearful power of Zeus is such that even Hades and the Titans imprisoned in Tartaros quiver from fear at the fight. As time went on, on, though, both his appearance and the description of the battle with Zeus shifted and acquired more detail, as was typical of myths mentioned in passing from both the epics and Theogony. One particularly detailed account of his appearance is found in Nonus's Dionysica. Then, at a nod from his mother, the Earth, Sicilian Typhus stretched out his hands and stole the snowy twos of Zeus, the tools of fire, then spreading his row of rumble-rattling throats, he yelled at his war cry, the cries of all beasts together, the snakes that grew from him waved over leopards' heads, licked the grim lions' maids, girdled their curly tails' spiral rise round the bulls' horns, mingled the shooting poison of their long tongues with the foams-like spittle of the boars. This passage seems to imply that the fur on these various animal heads is made of snakes, which is absolutely freaking terrifying, and if any artist in my community wants to attempt the hellish depiction described here, I'll feature it in the fan art portion of my next video after I receive it. Good gods. Also, I had to read this so you all get to suffer with me. His uh, eggplant was so big, Nana spent an entire line describing the sound of it slapping against his thighs. In detail. 
As the giant advanced with feet trailing in the briny flood, his bare loins were seen dry through the water, which broke heavy against his mid-thigh, crashing and booming. His serpents afloat sounded the charge with hissings from the brine-beaten throats. The spitting poison led the attack upon the sea. In later antiquity, his, uh, eggplant was depicted with a snake's head in at least one red figure vase. As in, it was a literal snake. You all now know that, and cannot unknow it. You are welcome. This depiction specifies that he throws rocks at Olympos and actually talks later about what the gods get up to as he does. The too long didn't read is that he wrecks the constellations of the sky and messes with the other gods so hard, Zeus ends up enlisting the help of new children of his to take him down. This version of the tale stresses his awesome power, but also that of Zeus. In the Theogony version, Gaia, his mother, literally melts down physically from the might of Zeus's thunderbolts. This takes that many steps further, describing both the terror Typhos rains down upon the world and Zeus's vanquishing of him in books one and two. As per usual, my sources will be in the description and I'll have a link to a publicly available translation for you all there. It's a heck of a read. Just like his victory over the Titans, we might see Zeus's might, but also his cleverness and trickery in this tale. It is with the help of one of his kin and deception on the part of those who believe in him that Zeus ultimately wins. Just another note that in every major conflict we see Zeus involved in that challenges his power, it's ultimately his cleverness, trickery, and gift exchange, not just his might that continues his rule. Number 12, Echidna. How can we talk about Typhos without bringing his consort Echidna, the mother of monsters, into the mix? Hesio describes her only briefly in Theogony. But Cato bore unto another unmanageable monsters like nothing human nor like the immortal gods either in a hollow cave. This was the divine and haughty Echidna, and half of her is a nymph with a fair face and eyes glancing, but the other half is a monstrous serpent, terrible, enormous, and squirming and voracious, there in the earth's secret places. For she has her cave on the underside of a hollow rock, far from the immortal gods and far from all mortals. There the gods ordained her to a fabulous home to live which she keeps underground among the Armoy, Grizzly Echidna, a nymph who never dies, and all her days she is ageless. Her main role in Theogony specifically was the mother of many other monsters on this list. All of her progeny, including the non-angliforms, are Orthros, Kerberos, the Hydra of Lerna, and the Chimera. Apollodorus also credits her with siring the Hesperian dragon, the Sphinx, the Caucasian eagle, and the Chromian sow. Hyginus also adds the Colchian dragon to the list, and good old Nanus adds another angliform, who I'll briefly mention here, Echidnades who was a serpent-footed ally of the Titans that got sent to his grave by Ares. There's also a story Herodotus attributes to the Pontic Greeks of Echidna spiriting away the horses of Heracles and refusing to give them back unless he gets it on with her. He does, but she puts off giving them back until she's good and, uh, satisfied? She gets pregnant, because this is the son of Zeus we're talking about, and asks him what to do with her three sons when they are grown. He gives her one of his bows and his belt, which has a golden vessel attached to the clasp. He tells her to let the son that can bend the bow remain with her in the land, but send the others away. Only her youngest, Scythus, could, so she sent the others away. Scythus was said to be the progenitor of the Scythians. According to Herodotus, they still wore vessels on their belts in deference to the myth. Hesiod does say that Bellerophon slayed Echidna with Pegasus and Theogony, but no real details are given on that. Number 11, the Gigantes. Yep, the giants. In my video on Heracles versus Disney's Hercules, I mentioned that the scriptwriters likely combined the event known as the Gigantomachy with the Titanomachy in a really weird way, as neither the Titans nor the Gigantes or giants looked anything like the character design that they went for. Well, a year later, I'm delivering on my promise to get into that more. Yay! Me? Self-congratulation aside, this is another guy got mad about her kids getting beaten up by Zeus and gave birth to angry things story. It actually just precedes the attack by Typhus because she gave birth to him after the gods defeated the giants. Still with me? In Theogony, we're told that the Gigantes came into being when the blood of Oranos' castration fell on Gaia and fertilized her. Later writers sometimes state that Gaia consorted with Tartaros, or the pit as it's often translated, to give birth to them. But y'all know that we tend to stick with the older sources here, right? Except we don't have a ton from the older sources. Homer doesn't mention much about them in the Odyssey, apart from mentioning that they're largely associated with volcanic regions, and Hesiod also only glancingly mentions them. Same with most attestations in writing through antiquity. However, we do have some art to reference for their appearance. In other words, we're in exactly the opposite position that we were with Typhos. 
After the 6th century BCE, we have over 600 images of the Gigantes and their battles with the various gods. The earliest depiction of them with serpent's feet dates to 400 to 375 BCE, fighting Dionysos. This giant's legs merge into serpents at the end in serpent heads, which is how the majority of the Gigantes are depicted in artwork, though Ogden does note in Dracon that there are five other forms, with a singular double proper tail, i.e. no serpent head on the end, with each of their legs splitting into two serpent heads instead of one, two fifth tails instead of their serpent heads, or serpents sprouting from the hips or shoulders, and serpents mixed into their hair. Fun fact, though in Theogony, the Aegis was said to originate with Athena's birth, in later antiquity, Pseudo Apollodorus associated both it and her epithet Pallas with the slaying of a gigante of the same name. She was said to have stripped off his skin after dispatching him and wore it as armor. This refers specifically to the Aegis. Wild how mythology transforms with culture, huh? I'll link Theo's website referencing the various gigantes by name below. There's not a ton of textual attestation for them, but the site's team has done a fantastic job cataloging what we do have. The gigantes trying to overthrow the Olympians on Gaia's orders as revenge for the defeat of the Titans is similar enough to both Typhus' story and the Titanomachy that I feel I've gotten as deep into it as I need to for this video. Number 10, Orthrus. Orthros was a two-headed, serpent-tailed dog, first mentioned in Hesiod's Theogony as one of the children of Echidna. It was said to guard the crimson-colored cattle of Geryon of Erethea, and Heracles was sent to kill it as one of the Twelve Labors. Theogony makes brief mention of this, as does Pseudopolidorus. Both mention that he kills both Orthros and Geryon in order to fetch the cattle for Eurystheus. Orthros was said to have fathered the Nemean lion, another of Heracles' labors, with our next snake hybrid, the Chimera. Number nine, the Chimera. Unlike some of the stories that I'll talk about in this video, the Chimera story is in both Hesiod's library and the Iliad and doesn't change a lot in later works. Bellerophon is tasked with slaying it after the wife of King Protus in Argos tries to seduce him, is rebuffed, and lies to her husband saying that he in fact assaulted her against her will. The king sends instructions to his in-law, Iobates, with a sealed letter. Because Iobates already had established Xenia with Bellerophon before reading the letter, he refuses to kill him and instead sends him on impossible tasks. Tasks, one of which we'll discuss later. Ogden notes that all three of Bellerophon's tasks have a distinctly female element and that the Chimera is no exception. She was said to have the body of a lion, the head of a lion, and the head of a goat growing from the middle of her back with a long serpent tail. Oh, she also breathes fire. Bellerophon spears her from the back of Pegasus and is rewarded for completing the three tasks with Protus' daughter when he realizes the gods were on Bellerophon's side the whole time. This is actually attested in one of the fragments that we have from the Catalog of Women from Hesiod as well, so it is a very, very old story. Number eight, the Gorgons. There are three Gorgons, one of which you all know as one of the more contentious figures in the myth to modern eyes, Medusa. Now, Hesiod mentions Medusa among the Gorgons birthed by Quito, along with her sisters, Steno and Yurale. She's mentioned as being the only mortal of the three, but nothing of being transformed into something monstrous in punishment by Athena here, which you would think would be mentioned by Hesiod if that myth had developed yet, though he does mention that Poseidon took her as a lover in a field. It's only later in antiquity that we see the myths of Poseidon Poseidon's seduction in Athena's Temenos, which is portrayed by Ovid as non-consensual, yet still punished by Athena. Pseudo Apollodora said that she was punished for thinking she was more beautiful than Athena, which is more in line with these sorts of transformative tales. Regardless, in the oldest tales, there isn't a mention of violation or punishment. She was like her sisters, only mortal. In all of them, Perseus slays her by cutting off her head and from her neck strings Pegasus, who is later tamed by Bellerophon with the help of Athena. Her head was mounted on Athena's Aegis and her blood given to Ascalus. Sclepios, who using his left hand would use it to destroy the health of people and using his right could bring them back to life. Athena also gave Heracles a lock of Medusa's snake hair. Apparently the fearful stone turning effect of its appearance was similar to her whole head. When Heracles went out against Lacedaemon, he gave the lock of hair to Stero, the daughter of Cepheus, as a protection of the town of Tegea, as the sight of it would terrify their enemies. Athena was also said to have invented the flute in part based on the sounds of the calls of the Gorgons. We don't get very much information about the other two sisters, though in some of the myths Perseus also slayed them. Medusa is the one that's the most talked about. Number seven, Caecrius. 
Kaikaris is interesting, as he's separately attested in various places as a Dracon himself, the slayer of one, and a keeper of one. According to one Hesiodic fragment preserved by Strabo, Kaikaris raised the Kaikriades snake that destroyed the item of Salamis. Eurolikos expelled the serpent, and Demeter received it at Eleusis and made it her servant. Apparently, Kaikaria was one of the old names for Salamis. In the 2nd century AD, Pausanias gives an account that Kaikarius was actually a snake hybrid himself, described as a dracon that helped out the Athenians during a naval battle with the Persians. And there is a sanctuary of Kaikarius. It is said that a dracon appeared amongst the ships when the Athenians were fighting their sea battle against the Persians. The god prophesied to the Athenians that the hero was Kaikarius. The sanctuary itself was founded in the 4th century BCE, so the late attestation still likely stems from an old founding myth. There are also attestations that Kaikrius could have potentially manifested as an anguipede himself, specifically in the Lycophronian Alexandria, which refers to the Dracon's Land Act, the sceptered land of the double-formed Earthborn One. Ogden mentions a fragment from the 3rd century BCE, Euphorion, that mentions Kaikrius as a dragon slayer. He's cited as the son of Poseidon and Salamis, and through the slaying of the beast, he acquires the kingship of Salamis. We'll get deeper into the associations between heroes, the dead, and snakes in a future video. Don't worry, it's a deep dive. Number 6. Erectonius. I actually first mentioned Erectonius and his stories in my video on the Athenian New Year, link in the iCard, but I would like to get a bit deeper here. Erectonius and Erecteos are both foundational kings of Attica, and very important to the foundation myths of Athens in particular, though both appear to have stemmed from the Homeric Erecteos. The former of the two, Erectonios, is the one with strong serpent attestations. 3rd century BCE, Amelisagoras claims that Hephaestos tried to overcome Athena and violate her consent but Athena was such a badass that she resisted him and his sperm spilled on the ground. Gaia birthed Electonios as a result, and Athena adopted him. She put him in a basket and gave him to the daughters of Cacrops to raise, instructing them specifically not to look inside. But they couldn't help themselves, opened the lid, and were killed by two snakes that were inside the box with Erectonios. Most artwork depicting him prior to the 2nd century AD depicts him as a human baby with the two serpents, sometimes in pursuit of the Cacropedes. After the 2nd century AD, however, we get some artistic depictions showing him with anguipede features, especially a snake's tail below the torso. Number 5. Cacropes only one account of Cacrops' myth actually survives, and it's from Apollodorus. According to him, Cacrops was the first king of Athens and was born of Gaia with a body combined of man and dracon. He named Attica Cacropia after himself. In the founding myth of Attica, it was said that Poseidon and Athena competed for partisanship over the city. Poseidon gifted the Athenians with a well, later known as the Erechtheian well, as it was enclosed in the temple of Erechtheos, and Athena the olive tree. Cacrops gave Athena the victory when when he pointed out that he had witnessed her planting the olive tree, whereas Poseidon had no witnesses that he had created the well. He was said to be the author of the first elements of civilized life, according to Pausanias. Marriage, the twelve communities of Attica, the offering of cakes to Zeus in lieu of blood offerings, and he was also said to be the first man to ever offer sacrifices to Athena in myth. He married Agralaus and had one son, Erisktthon, and three daughters, Agralaus, named after her mother, Herse, and Pendrosos. Some depictions of him show him as fully human, though most show him with a human's head and torso and a serpent's tail, sometimes splitting into two at the end. Some attestations show him sharing bodily characteristics with a fish rather than snakes, though these are rarer. Number 4. The Lamiae Lamia is sometimes a proper name for an individual monster and sometimes a classification for a group of them. Given there are quite a few, I will link further reading below for those of you who are interested. The first tale mentioned by Ogden has strong associations with Apollon and is depicted on an Omphalos dating somewhere between 475 and 450 BCE. Kalimachus depicts the seduction and impregnation of Psamath, the daughter of Crotopus of Argos. Terrified she'll be caught as no longer pure and fit for marriage by her father, she drops her baby, Lunos, in his father's sheep pens where he is torn apart by sheepdogs. Racked with guilt at the death of her son, she confesses to her father and he has her put to death. Apollon then sends the Lamia Poenicaer to wreak vengeance for the child and his mother, and she seizes the babies from their mother's breasts and devours them. 
Korobos kills the monster, and the Argives knock her teeth out and dismember the corpse, which pisses Apollon off, so he sends another plague down on Argos, which can only be solved by sacrificing Korobos. He goes to Delphi and offers to sacrifice himself, but Apollon ends up so charmed by him that he spares him with the caveat that he can't ever go back to Argos. Apollon then gives him a tripod and tells him to carry it as far as he can and found a new city wherever he drops it. This is the founding myth of Tripodiskoi in the Megarid. This Lamia is described by later authors as definitely anguipede, with a snake's tail below the torso and, in some renditions, a snake between her eyes. The second Delphic Lamia story deals with a creature called either the Lamia or Sibaris, which would leave her cave and attack the Delphians and their flocks. Apollon told the Delphians that they could get rid of the monster only by exposing a young male citizen to her. The Delphians drew lots and the unfortunate fate fell on Alcyonius. Yerebatus caught sight of him and fell in love, so he substituted himself, took on his sacrificial garlands, and hurled the beast off a mountain. She disappeared and the spring Sabatus appeared in her place. During the second sophistic, tales circulated about a host of Lamiae, which were man-eating double-headed female monsters. One of their heads was beautiful, that of a maiden, and where you would expect it to be. The other was a terrible serpent at the end of their anguipede tail and also served as their trunk and legs. They'd show off their naked bosoms to men and lure them in while hiding the serpent portion, then grab the men with thick beast-like claws and use the serpent head to inject venom that would kill them near instantly before they devoured them. Hey, at least they were nice enough to kill them first. Another class of Lamiae, mentioned by Philostratus, is a more ghost-like than beast-like Lamia. She presents herself as a rich and beautiful Phoenician woman to seduce and consume Melnipos, who is a handsome student of Apollonius of Diana. Apollonius warns him, but Melnipos is smitten. At their wedding, Apollonius reveals that the finery she beguiled him with was mere illusion, and her intention was to fatten him up with pleasure and eat him. She's never really described except when Apollonius tells Melnipos that he has a snake on his bosom and it is a snake that warms him. At least this tale ended with his mentor seeing through the guise. The tale of Lamia Queen of Libya wasn't so lucky. One of Zeus's many lovers, an enraged Hera stole her children and cursed her with the inability of sleep, which drove her so mad with grief that she tore out her own eyes. Zeus transformed her into a demon that gave her the ability to remove and restore her own eyes, but she was still said to steal and devour children in ancient times. Number three, the Arinyes. This is interesting, as I first encountered the snaky association with the Furies in Ogden's Dracon. Homer and Hesiod don't give us physical descriptions of the Arinyes, preferring instead to dwell on their terrifying might and refusal to be swayed in propitiation if they have you specifically in their sights. However, Aeschylus in the Aristea trilogy and later Euripides both give them physical form. Specifically in Aeschylus Eumenides, the chorus applies the word Dracaine, or she-serpent, to the Furies pursuing Orestes. Sleep and toil, if Effective conspirators have destroyed the force of the dreadful dragoness, the chorus cries. Dracaine is a word applied to all of the feminine hybrids on this list. We'll go over the difference between Dracon and Ophis in a future video if there even is one, but the fact is that this word specifically is used by the chorus in the play and is significant in this way. At other points, they are compared to the Gorgons, implying snakes as or in their hair. On the subject of Euripides in Iphigenia and Taurus, Orestes sees one of the Erinyes as a she-serpent of Hades, or a Haido Dracaina, that wants him dead. He describes this goddess thus, Pallades, do you see her? Do you not see Hell's dragon, how she wants to kill me, fringed with her dreadful vipers against me? And the one who breathes fire and slaughter from her robe and her wings? My mother in her arms, the rocky mass, oh how she hurls it at me. Ah, she will kill me, where can I escape? Because could not see these shapes, but he alternated the sounds of sheep and the howling of dogs to send forth the Fury's imitations. In Orestes, Euripides refers to the Erinyes as bloody-faced, serpent-like maidens, or Dracondodes Korai. Mother, I implore you, do not shake at me those maidens with their bloodshot eyes and snaky hair. Here they are, close by, to leap upon me. And in Electra, we're told that Athena has to ward them off, and that they have snakes wrapped around their arms. Go to Athens and embrace the holy image of Pallas for she will prevent them flickering with dreadful serpents from touching you as she stretches over your head her 
gorgon-faced shield. The most detailed description, however, comes from Virgil's Enid, where Tisiphone carries a whip in her right hand and a serpent in her left, Electo is explicitly compared to a gorgon and carries snakes in her hair, and Megara is winged and bound with coils of serpents. In other words, the snaky associations of the Furies are pretty explicit. Their main role was as the dispensers of Agos against Oathbreakers, potentially even in the afterlife. This is a terrifying reminder. Do not make oaths lightly and take great care not to break them. It was said in some sources that Persephone commanded them and their roles as dispensers of justice in comedy and tragedy is pretty well attested. It's well worth exploring some of the plays I mentioned to glean a deeper understanding of their nature. Number two, Hecate. Yeah, I know, this one surprised me too. One of the earliest vase paintings we have of Hecate, dating all the way back to 470 BCE in Athens, shows Hecate as having two dog heads tearing a soul apart with a long, snaky tail appendage like that of the Lamia. This isn't the end of it though. Not only does her close association with the Erinyes link Hecate to snakes, but also a number of texts and depictions from the classical era onward cements the Hecate as a snake hybrid viewpoint. For example, a fragment of Aristophanes refers to Hecate of the Earth, rolling coils of snakes, while a fragment of Sophocles describes her as garlanded with oak and the twisted coils of savage Dercantes. Ogden notes that the former image calls back to the anguipede form of Hecate on the vase painting, whereas Sophocles combines both her anguipede variant and the branches coming off the Erinyes in the same depiction. Moving forward to the first century AD, a lead prayer for justice from the Agora assigns thieves to the attention of Pluton, Hermes, the Morai, Persephone, the Erinyes, and Hecate. Hecate is described in this prayer as three-faced and an eater of the things the gods demand, which again ties her back to the vase depiction. The prayer also has an image of Hecate with six arms. The top two hold torches, the middle whips, and the bottom two are snakes with their tongues sticking out. In the second century AD, we have a description from Lucian in Philopsuda through the narrator Eucrates. He talks about an encounter he had with her in a great deal of detail. I saw a fearsome woman approaching me, almost half a stadium's length high. In her left hand, she held a torch and in her right, a sword 20 cubits long. Below her waist, she had a snake foot. Above it, she resembled a gorgon, so far as concerns the look of her eyes and her terrible appearance. Instead of hair, writhing snakes fell down in curls about her neck and some of them coiled over her shoulders. He describes how large her dogs were, then talks about how he averted her with a magic ring. When he used it, Hecate stamped on the ground with her snake foot and created a huge chasm, as deep as Tartarus. She dumped into it and was gone. We'll get more into the underworld associations and Hecate, as well as snake associations with the underworld in a future video. For now, it's pretty clear that for a good chunk of history, Hecate was seen as a snake hybrid in some form or another. In the next video in the series, I'll dive a lot more into the associations between divinities, snakes, healing, boundaries, and the dead, so don't worry. Just enjoy the newfound knowledge about one of the more popular goddesses in recent times. Finally, number one, Kerberos. Wait, the three-headed good boy of Hades? Well, actually, the 50-headed son of Echidna with the serpent's tail, but yes. Kerberos was said in Theogony to guard the entrance of Hades, wagging his ears at those who come in, but not allowing them to leave, instead eating any soul he catches trying to get out. The main myth involving Kerberos regards Heracles' 12 labors, in which the titular hero is asked by the king to bring the Hound of Hades to him. He negotiates with Hades to be allowed to do this, but only if he doesn't harm Kerberos in the process. So begins an arduous series of dragging, wrestling, carrying, and cowing the brute until he finally tosses him at the foot of a terrified king. His snaky tail is mentioned frequently in descriptions of him all through the classical and archaic eras, as are his many heads, though later antiquity only identifies him in depictions as having three. Which is understandable, as drawing 50 to 100 heads on a hound would be quite the artistic challenge prior to the digital age. Kerberos, much like many of the snake hybrids I've mentioned, including the Erinye, Hecate, Medusa, Echidna, and Typhos, has strong underworld associations being its guardian. Snakes generally seem to have strong underworld and hero code associations in Hellenism. Although, as we'll cover in the next video in this series, they also have strong associations with healing. It'll be a bit before I get to it, but rest assured, I've already started the research and it's gonna be a deep dive. With that said, thank you so much for sticking through that. If you're new here, poison the subscribe button and drive the like from your web browser. Drop down into the comments and let me know if I missed anyone, or tell me which of these surprised or delighted you the most, and whether you'd like me to make listicles like this in long form again in the future, and about what. Special thanks also to my patrons.
You all have been watching me rant and rave about this research video for weeks, and I thank you both for your patience and your perseverance. Many of you were really excited for this topic, and I hope I did a job befitting the support you give me. One of the monographs I used for this was over $150 to pick up, and was absolutely vital for a few of the entries on this list. Without you, I wouldn't have been able to afford it. May the cycle of reciprocity between us ever remain positive. And remember, we're stronger together.